chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Jesus heals many. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought, brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had varied diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Demons. This is the word of God for the people of God. But I did talk about uh, demons in last week's scripture. So we're going from casting out of demons from last week to healing this week. And it's still in the Gospel of Mark, which moves very quickly. And it takes us on a fast pace through Jesus' ministry. One moment, heaven is torn apart when he is baptized by John. And we then move into his healings and his teachings. The world was turned upside down at the moment Jesus came up from the Jordan River. And from then on, the story of his ministry quickly unfolds. And as I mentioned, the book of Mark does not have anything in it about the birth of Jesus. It's almost as if the author knew that what should be focused on was his ministry. Jesus' teachings, healings, and the casting out of demons take up a lot of the book of Mark. Everything is sacred. There is no place Jesus is unwilling to go. And he dives into the depths of the broken, the demon-possessed, the sick, and those who are searching. Jesus meets those who are out of control of their own lives perhaps because of personal choices, perhaps through no fault of their own. What the community considered unclean and should be avoided, Jesus finds pulsing with the presence of the holy. What society shunned and stood apart from, Jesus challenges with healing and compassion. Something to take notice on is how different the story is from the one last week where Jesus confronted the demon-possessed man. There are many differences between the exorcism and then the healing in this scripture. There are just some maladies that require a full, full confrontation and some that require a more gentle touch. The key, of course, is to know the difference between the two. Now, previously, we met the disciples, Philip and Bartholomew, who came from the book of John. Here we are meeting Simon and Andrew. And in these ten scripture verses, there is a lot that takes place here. It begins with a healing and ends with Jesus alone and praying. Here in Mark, we are in the beginning stages of Jesus putting together his twelve disciples. So far, there are four. And after Jesus casts out the demons, Simon invites him to his home where Jesus heals his mother-in-law. This is the fifth documented recorded miracle that Jesus did, and it is recorded in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and Mark. Stories like this can show how different the Gospels are, and it emphasizes their, it's emphasized differently in each story. In Matthew 8, 14 through 15, he simply touches her and her fever is gone. In Luke, he stands over her and orders the fever to leave, and it does. But here in Mark, he helps the woman from her bed and she is healed. In all three
story accounts, the woman is healed. But each is written from a different point of view. And whenever people witness something amazing or tragic, if you interview them, you would get similar but different stories. Now Jesus goes to the home of Simon Peter, and as they enter, something reminds Simon about his mother-in-law's health. Maybe he says, glad you are here, Jesus, but please keep it down. My mother-in-law is very ill, and she needs to rest. There's no asking here, no plea of faith, no request made to please go and make her well. He just welcomes Jesus into his home. The next thing you know, though, Jesus is marching down the hallway and into the mother-in-law's room. And he takes her by the hand, and he lifts her up. Up until this point, Jesus had a confrontation at the synagogue. He had called some of his disciples from their fishing boats, but nothing to the extent of healing someone who was very, very sick. The power this shows is amazing. I mean, what do you think is running through the minds who are there when Jesus strides off to find a fevered woman and pulls her to her feet? This small little thing is very taboo in itself at that time. First off, it was the contact between a man and woman, the laws of hospitality between guest and host, being in the presence of the sick, just to mention a few. Yet Jesus goes forward to the woman's bed without so much as a hesitation, without so much as a word. And the healing of her is silent. There's no word spoken. No pronouncement of your sins are forgiven. Your faith has made you well. He just takes hold of her hand and helps her to her feet. And I'm sure there were eyes popping and people were straining their necks to get a look at what was taking place. In this simple healing, Jesus showed both simplicity and also power. He healed with the same authority he used when he cast the demon out of the man. And immediately after she is healed, what does she do? She responds the way we all should when we are blessed by Christ. She begins to serve him out of gratitude. And she didn't serve just Jesus. She served all that were present. When we are blessed, and the blessing spills out on those around us, we don't just bask in the healing, in the blessing. We get to work. Some immediately jump to the conclusion that she felt she was paying off a debt, that she was doing something to earn this gift. But I believe she was responding to the blessing that she received. To me, she's also maybe a no-nonsense type of woman who did not break out into loud hallelujahs and praises for being healed. She simply went back to work for her life returned to normal. And this healing story is short, but it carries a lot of meaning. This woman is also, if you notice, not given a name. And the importance of that is because it keeps Jesus as the main focus. There are many stories, or then the story moves back to Jesus among the multitudes, among the people who are clamoring to find him. The word had gotten out. Hope stirred many feet, so they beat a path to the door where he was. And Mark implies that the healings and the demon removals continued well into the night. It says in verse 33, the whole town gathered at the door. Not sure how many folks were in this town, but there must have been a lot of people outside the home of Simon and Andrew. The first two exorcisms and healing Jesus did opened a floodgate, and people wanted to see him, to be touched by him. I mean, if I was there, I would be clamoring to try to see him. His fame spread quickly. It was a busy day for Jesus. He served the people well into the night. He worked very hard to serve others, putting himself behind what he needed to do. And at some point, however, he did catch a little sleep because in verse 35, Jesus gets up before the dawn when it's still dark. 
and he goes off by himself to pray. He wanted a little alone time. A time to breathe, to pray, to connect with the source of his strength. Jesus did not pray because he was weak, but because he was strong. And the source of his strength was his relationship with God, his Father. Jesus knew that pressure and busyness should drive us towards prayer, not from prayer. But how often when we are under stress or overly busy with our lives do we stop and pray? It's often something that gets pushed aside and forgotten, when it should be something that is kept at the very top of our to-do list. I admit, I often don't take time in my day to pray as I should. For me, it is a, what I call a continuous work in progress. And how often do we get to go off to a solitary place like Jesus did, with a busy, busy family that is impossible sometimes? Now, have any of you seen the movie War Room? Great movie. In the movie, an older woman befriends a younger woman who is having some difficulties in her marriage. The older lady shares with her a closet that she calls her war room. It's a room where she goes to pray, to pray for those fighting spiritual warfare, to pray for those she knows are struggling for the world, for whatever is laid on her heart. She goes into this closet to pray. Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will re reward you openly. Now, it doesn't say how long Jesus was gone in this passage, but it was enough that his disciples noticed. And they became concerned, and they started looking for him. He took the time he needed. He kept his priorities, even in the face of the demands of him that continued. And Simon and the others found him and said, everyone is searching for you. Everyone in the crowd, the hungry and the needy, is searching for you. And at this point, however, Jesus moves on. Verse 38, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there. That is what I have come, or that is why I have come. So why does he just up and leave? It doesn't feel right to leave behind those who were searching for him, those who were hurting and needed healing, but he does. He moves on, not to avoid the responsibility since he healed and taught and exercised there. He kept focused on the mission, even when it seems a bit harsh. It was his mission to service mission and service to cover more ground in a limited amount of time. He did not stay in the town and ride the crest of his popularity. He moved on. He knew his ministry was to preach all across Galilee. His ministry was not being famous or enjoying the fame. It was to spread and to keep going. Some would have stayed in one place and focused on those who were already there. Some argue that our Emphasis ought to be on the ones who belong, who have already come. Yet Jesus says, I have to go to those who haven't heard about me yet. I have to continue to move out, to go further, to speak to more. But what about those who have already heard? Those there are now clamoring, clamoring to hear more from him. Don't we care about them? It reminds me of the parable of the 99 sheep. One book, this parable is in, is in the book of Luke, and I think I included it under sheet. A shepherd is taking care of 100 sheep, and one wanders off. The shepherd leaves the remaining 99 untended to search for the one lone sheep. Some would argue, don't leave the 99. They are more important than one lost sheep. But what if you are that one lost sheep. The 99 have the community of each other, but the one that is lost is alone. 
Those people who have heard Jesus and want to hear more have the experience of Jesus that they can share with one another. They can build on the knowledge that they already have. So Jesus moves on so he can reach those who have not heard. And we who carry the name of Jesus before us must, like him, carry it out to those who have not heard, those who don't yet know him. Our goal is to make disciples to transform this world, even as we are being made disciples. That is our service. Like Simon's mother, we just don't serve him. We serve them, all of them, any of them. We serve everyone, and we serve continuously. Would you pray with me? Gracious and Heavenly Father, it is our job to serve and to share your word and to spread your name and your love and your grace and everything that we can do. For as disciples, that is our job. And with that job, we can transform this world and we can make it a more beautiful place. In your name we pray. Yes. Uh -huh.